these debates have turned into a contest to score zingers. And this was not something that debates used to consist of. I mean, you can go back to some of the earlier televised debates and the famous one in 1960 between Richard Nixon and uh, John Kennedy. I'm not sure there were any zingers at all. Now, they would hit each other on various points like a missile gap or this, that, or the other thing. But zingers, and I'm using that term in air quotes, is something like what Lloyd Benson did to Dan Quayle in a famous vice presidential debate uh, that occurred in uh, 1980. Was it in 87 or 88, Ben? But it was the 1988 campaign, Michael Dukakis against the first George Bush. And Dan Quayle was like a male Sarah Palin, uh, young, really young, almost too young to be president if it had come to that, uh, good-looking guy on the ticket and everything, and he was sort of being slammed for that. And so he mentioned at the debates, you know, he addressed that, and he said, I'm, I'm the same age John F. Kennedy was when he became president, da-da-da-da-da. And uh, Lloyd Benson was quite a bit older, obviously, and he turned to Dan Quayle. And I, I'm not sure if this was... I, I can't even see how you could have planned for this zinger. So it, it, it was so good. And he turned around to Dan Quayle and said, um, I knew John F. Kennedy... John F. Kennedy was a friend of mine. You, sir, are no John F. Kennedy. And the place just erupted, um, and, and, and it threw Dan Quayle for a loop, too. That's a zinger. Now, that's something that was really unusual at the time. They didn't go out there trying to make those moments. In this debate that's about to happen Wednesday, that is the number one thing they're trying to do. They are trying, right, you know, Barack Obama and Mitt Romney are out there right now trying to figure out, and they have a much, much more specific idea of what's going to be asked of them than people in past debates in the old days did, because now the two parties control the debates, they negotiate all this stuff ahead of time, so they have a very good idea of when zinger opportunities, zinger tunities, we'll call them, Ben, are going to occur, and the whole goal is to, bam, hit them with that, Right. We're not going to talk about specifics. We're not going to we're going to go for zingers. And then after the debate, you will have these panels of the Fox News or the CNN or the MSNBC or whatever experts who are going to talk about who won the debate. And it's all going to be based on who scored the most zingers. I guarantee. Right. Something that has nothing to do with the founding of the country, something you almost want to have like the late night. Um, you know, talk show hosts, uh, the Lenos and the Lettermans and those people uh, writing the speeches and the approaches rather than have these guys coached by policy experts or whatnot. You're going to have Romney slam Obama for the current state of things. You're going to have Obama slam the policies of Romney and his people for causing the state of things and saying he's trying to clean up the mess. It's pretty darn predictable how it's going to go. Everybody's going to be looking for, as I said, zinger tunities and zingers, and they're going to be looking for, um, you know, disasters. Does anybody fall apart? Do you have a, a deer in the headlights moment like you saw with the governor of Texas in the Republican primary debates? And if you have one of those, I mean, you know, I already think this thing is for the most part decided. But then, as we said months ago, Barack Obama, I thought, was going to win this election. Although my track record's not perfect, so don't let that you know fool you one way or the other. But I'm usually pretty good. Um, but if you have one of those deer in the headlight moments, that could be huge. So when we talk about what's going to happen in these debates, people want to avoid disaster. The chances of any kind of knockout blow are only in existence if you can somehow prompt such a disaster, right? Romney's got to appear more human and have a sense of humor and somehow appear not to act desperate. Because if you look at the way his campaign's been lately, he's just flailing. The president has to somehow find some of what he had when he ran for president the first time, but not have it look ridiculous, which is why he hasn't done this. I mean, we told you before the Democratic National Convention that he couldn't come out there and pull his hope and change stuff that he originally ran on the first time around because we've had him now. We know that that's just hollow rhetoric. So we had Bill Clinton come in and do the great job, and then he basically did nothing. He's got to figure out a way to capture the parts of the soaring oratory that allow him to take something that, let's be honest, is a gift he has and one of the advantages he has over Romney and yet not have it appear like something that's a hollow mockery 
of what the man's already done. I mean, he's out there pushing things like the middle class now, which I told you he would, right? I told you he was going to go the populist route because it's the smart thing to do, just like the smart thing for Romney to do, you know, if you open up your political handbook, is to attack the president over the economic situation and jobs. But none of these people are talking about what it would really mean if you followed their line of thinking down the road. The president could say, well, we're going to push the middle class. What the hell does that mean? And I guarantee you the things that people will say, because this is the way they do things. Now, this is small ball. We talked about this in the first part of the show. They will talk about tax credits. They will talk about tax breaks. They will. Talk, it's, it's just going to be related to tax policy. We're going to well, make it easier for more young people to go to college by providing a tax-free incentive for their parents, blah, 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 blah. I mean, folks, that's small ball stuff. That's tax code stuff. That's stuff most people don't even notice. And it's stuff that the Congress and everything else can get rid of when nobody's even looking. And you could throw in some wonderful little special interest giveaways in the riders and small print, right? Real talk about this, and you will, I guarantee you folks have no questions from the questioners about this, would involve things like, well, if you really want to help the middle class with jobs, how are you going to get them to compete with a globalized labor force that's just as well educated and just as skilled as they are, with companies who have all sorts of tax incentives from our government to move operations elsewhere, Mr. President or Governor Romney? You're not going to hear that, folks. You're going to hear a bunch of rhetoric about tax credits and who's allowed the jobs to go away and the government's taken over General Motors and a bunch of nonsense with everybody looking for zingers. Today's show is brought to you by Audible. Please visit audiblepodcast.com forward slash Dan Carlin for your free audiobook download. 